Hello and welcome to Out Loud, our conversation, or I guess my conversation about uh, the, the letter of First John. It's what we've been working on and it's only taken four weeks and we've already gotten to the second chapter. So I'm going to go ahead and begin by, by reading the scripture. We're going to look at the second chapter, the first six verses, and, and here we read, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is God's way of dealing with our sins, not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. This is how we know him if we keep his commandments. The one who claims I know him while not keeping his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in this person. But the love of God is truly perfected in whoever keeps his word. This is how we know we are in him. The one who claims to remain in him ought to live in the same way as he lived. So it's a passage that has a good amount of, of comfort talking about if we fall short, if we sin, we have in Jesus an advocate with the Father. We have one in whom we can be perfected. Um, at the same time, it is a passage that is extremely challenging in that it starts out, basically, I'm writing to you these things so that you don't sin, so that you don't do anything that would be against God's will. Um, and what the, those passages and it, and it streams throughout these 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 words here, these verses, is really a statement against something that Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, which is cheap grace. Cheap grace is a, a belief that well, Jesus died for my sins, and if I sin, then then Jesus will be my advocate, as this passage tells us. And so, it really doesn't matter if I sin or not. So, why do I need to worry about those things that work for me? And and if they're sinful, if they're not sinful, you know, I have this this get out of jail free card in 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 Jesus, and and so. I just get to have this grace at, at no cost to myself. Well, certainly that isn't what the writer of this letter would have would have said is 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 pointed here as it talks about if you don't if you don't follow God's commandments, then you don't know Jesus. And I grew up in in a, a Baptist background and, and one of the fundamental questions that, that we were taught that, that we had to answer for ourselves and everybody had to answer for themselves is that do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior mirroring this language from this scripture? Do you know Jesus Christ? Which implies by this passage is your life without sin. Of course, our standard Christian answer is our life without sin. The answer is no. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one that the Bible claims other than Jesus who was ever able to live a life utterly without sin. Now, to better understand this passage, I think we need to talk about what we mean by sin. We use this word, we're going to use this word a lot throughout this, this book, and already have used it a lot. So, I would suggest you a, a helpful definition for me. I won't say it is the definitive definition. That would be a tremendous act of ego on my part, but a very helpful definition of sin that, that works for me in, in every circumstance that I have been able to, to, to come up with is simply that sin is anything that does harm, does harm to you or does harm to to someone else. I used to say, and or does harm to your relationship with God, but honestly, I backed away from that because if an action doesn't do harm to you or to someone else or an inaction, then 
that whatever that is enhances your relationship with God. Wherever we are not doing harm, then our, our life is, is more connected to God. So there, you know, you can, you can apply this definition, but oftentimes if you ask somebody, you know, what, how do you define sin? They said, well, just look in the Bible, read through the commandments and, and it'll tell you, here's what, here are all the things that are sin. And you can read through the 10 commandments and you can read through the, the first five books of, of, of the Bible that, that lay out the law as, as, as given to Moses and the, and the people, uh, and say, well, that's what sin is. And, and you can look at other passages, uh, I believe it's the second chapter of Romans, where Paul lays out a, a long list of things that, that he regards as sin as he tries to sort of sweep up everybody into this understanding that, that all have sinned. The problem that, that I have with this is that so much of that is connected with the the standards and, and, and cultural norms of the time. And here's a, here's a good example, and, and we can apply it two ways. In, in Deuteronomy, there are a number, around chapter 20 or so, there are a number of, of laws, commandments, written about how much should be paid to a, a father in order to, to marry his daughter under all kinds of dip, different circumstances, including the this circumstance in which the, the man has, has uh, assaulted the woman in somewhere and, and, and then is required to, to marry her and pay the appropriate bride price for the husband. Now, if you're looking at sin as just, here are all of the commandments, you look at the Bible, read the commandments, and, and that tells you exactly what sin is, then if we don't follow those rules about bride price and we don't pay the appropriate amount of money or, or goods to the Father, then we have not followed that commandment, and, and thus that is, is sin and, and puts us in, in conflict with the passage that I just read. But if we apply it and look at those passages within their cultural norm and think about sin as how are you doing harm, then the, we don't just ignore this as, well, that's just something that they used to do and we don't do it anymore. But we look at it and say, okay, here was the intent of that passage, of those passages about bride pies. The intent was that in a marriage circumstance that you do no harm to the, the, the future bride's family, that you follow what is just within the cultural norms that you do no harm in that circumstance. Now, if we were to follow those, those things to the letter of the law today, I think we would do tremendous harm, and I think it, uh, we would do tremendous harm to, to women in society, to, to marriage, and to a whole bunch of other things. But it doesn't, saying that sin is about doing no harm doesn't eliminate this. It means that we have to understand what was the harm they were trying to prevent at that particular circumstance. And then we have to look at things as, are we doing harm in, in the time that we are? Now, it's not unbiblical to take all of these laws and, and, and combine them into a, a simple concept. Jesus did the very same thing and in complete agreement with the biblical scholars of his time. They asked him, what, are the, the, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, love you, the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, in these are contained all the, the law, words of the law and the prophets. So in, in that moment, Jesus was taking all of these lists and bringing it down to, a, to a, a, a straightforward concept of loving God and loving your neighbor. So then how do we deal with this? Because we know that we still fall short, even if we're trying to just simplify and, and doing no harm. Because one of the things I would say is sin isn't dependent on your intent. On your intent, if it does harm, it is sin, whether you intended to do harm or not. Something that you do accidentally 
and, and it causes harm is still sin. That's one of the ways that we, we can all say, even when we're trying to be very good per- people, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For instance, an, an example of this is I, I had an opportunity while I was in seminary to go to Guatemala, and one of the places that we went, drove by, and stopped, and 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 our our guides told us about was a a, a clothing factory, essentially a a sweatshop where working conditions were very poor, pay was very poor, but the people had to to live with it because outside that that garment factory was at least a dozen other people who had a a moment's notice would have taken your job. So we we go to the clothing store and we see a, a garment that says made in Guatemala and we know that that they're made in these, these unjust, cruel conditions. And we say, well, I'm not going to purchase that. Well, that's, that's a, a, a good-hearted, right-thinking kind of thing to do. But at the same time, if we refuse to buy any of those clothes, those, those factories close down, and then even the meager bad work that these people have disappears. So it is possible to, to care and, and try to do the right thing and still do harm. So we can, I think in that sense, we can follow the passage that we have here. We can strive in all we do to do no harm in the assurance not that, well, we can do whatever we want, but that the fact that I'm probably going to do harm anyway I can have the assurance that in God's grace through Jesus Christ that I can have forgiveness for the harm that I have. But if we know Jesus, then every moment in our life we are striving to do no harm. We are striving to live without sin. Thank you for listening.